Good evening and welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup companies and the venture capitalists who fund them. I'm Chris Gill, President and CEO of SVAs, the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, the largest and fastest growing not-for-profit for entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Tonight, I'm delighted to have with us Randy Commissar from Kleiner Perkins Coffee and Buyers. Randy has got an extensive background. He's been uh, an attorney, um, an entrepreneur, a uh, venture capitalist, and of course an author uh, with the famous book, uh, the, the Riddle and the Monk. Monk and the Monk, Riddle. Monk and the Riddle. <laughs> and now has his new book out, Getting to Plan B. So Randy, thank you very much for coming along. It's Appreciate a great thinking. pleasure. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Um, just to set the scene, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are now? It's, yeah, it's, it's eclectic, as you sort of pointed out. I am... Um, when I, when I graduated from college, I actually worked as a rock promoter for a number of years. Um, and I know you have an interest in rock and playing a classic rock band. Uh, I also helped run a community development program in the city of Providence. And I taught economics in a cooking school in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and so I did all three of those things at the same time and, and really enjoyed myself. And then I went on to law school, uh, graduated from law school, and became a litigator on the East Coast. But I was really drawn to the West Coast. I, at that time, there were pictures of these long-haired duos like uh, Wozniak and Jobs on the cover of things like Business Week or whatever, and yeah. I just thought this was the place I needed to go. And so I found my way out here as a, first as a lawyer, mm -hmm. and then uh, later went to Apple Computer, as, um, started as, as senior counsel, moved on to sort of business development, and then did my first startup, Claris Corporation, which was a spin-out from Apple in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. Did it with Bill Campbell, a terrific guy, my mentor and good friend today. Uh, he's, you know, chairman of Intuit, ran Intuit for a number of years, uh, consigliari to Google, consigliari to Apple today. So I, uh, we did, we did uh, Claris together, mm -hmm. and then Go Corporation, which was a pioneer in pen computing. Right. Uh, a failed pioneer in pen computing. Uh, and then off, I went off to run LucasArts Entertainment for George Lucas. I got into the entertainment business. Did that for a while. Later I ran a startup for um, Kleiner Perkins called Crystal Dynamics in the gaming business. Mm -hmm. And then the internet happened. And I sort of redesigned and retooled myself as something called a virtual CEO. Uh, virtual CEO was my attempt to try to do all the good parts I loved about the CEO job and none of the bad parts. Okay. Did it work? <laughs> well, it did, actually. I did, we did Web TV and we did TiVo and Mondo Media and a series of companies during that period of time where I would um, work a portfolio of companies. I worked very closely to the entrepreneur but not displace them. Mm -hmm. Never took the CEO role per se but provided them with the guidance and experience that I had in building their organization, building their business. And that worked quite well. And right around 1998, the height of the, of the boom, I got kind of disillusioned with what I saw going on in the valley. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, what, I, what I knew about entrepreneurship, sort of that hard tenacity, the creativity, the, the, the aspects of entrepreneurship that I really love and am drawn to were being diluted mm. by these carpetbaggers coming in for the quick buck. And so I wrote a book called The Monk and the Riddle. started in 98 in the peak of the market, and the book was all about why the market would fail. Um, and to this day, nobody would have read that book except that it came out uh, in March of 2000. So uh, timing is everything, and the book became a, a bestseller. Brought me at Stanford actually invited me to come in as a consulting professor, and mm -hmm. I taught entrepreneurship there for a while. Did a number of social ventures. Had stopped doing for-profit ventures, and then got invited into Kleiner Perkins. Okay. So... That leads us on to where you are now, mm -hmm. and the recent book, Getting to Plan B, which was published last month. Actually, no, the beginning of uh, this month. The beginning of this month. Yeah. So we're very timely on this. What led you to come up with this new book? Yeah. Well, my co-author here, John Mullins, a professor at the London School of uh, Business, mm -hmm. he was at Stanford on a sabbatical uh, and was introduced to me uh, in order to talk about an idea he had about a business model book. Mm -hmm. And it was a great idea. Uh, but we end up in this debate about how business models derive from or relate to business plans. Okay. And I had taken the position that in my experience, the business plan and the ultimate business model tended to be pretty unrelated. Um, and it raised the question uh, for him as well. To, when he went back to London, he went back to his constituents, his students and his mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. I went back to my CEOs and others, and we posed the question, how often does plan A actually succeed? And the answer came back very seldom. And so we began to riff on this idea of if plan A fails most often, 
why is the convention to build a plan, yeah. sell the plan, execute against the plan until you hit the wall, disappoint and fail, and then try to reinvent it? Why didn't we have a better process where we could maximize the opportunity for success and minimize the resources and time wasted in failure? Okay, because so that is uh, very, very different from, mm -hmm. from the way that most entrepreneurs operate now. It is, you know, get this finely crafted mm -hmm. story yeah. with... Story is the right term, by the way. Okay, <laughs> with, with a, a PowerPoint presentation, an executive summary, and perhaps a 35-page business plan behind it. And you then sell this to the, to the VC and to yourself, hopefully, and you then try, and you, 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 your primary goal is to execute on this. Mm. Why is this not the right way to do it? Well, empirically, plan A most often fails. And in this book, we go through 39 cases of companies, and both large companies and small companies, mm -hmm. you know, U.S. companies and global companies, mm -hmm. for profit and not-for-profit companies. And we follow the trajectory of their success that is attributed to plan A, only to demonstrate in all those cases it was actually a later plan. Plan B, C, D, Z that ultimately led to their success. If that's empirically the case, then why do we create this, um, this, this illusion that we're in this together in order to execute against a plan based on hypothesis and assumption? How can a plan that's created before you ever have a product, before you ever have a customer, the projecting five years of revenue, be right? It almost can't. If it, if it was right, it'd have to be coincidence. And so if that's the truth, there's got to be a better way. Okay, so as that is a starting point, I'm a brand new, first time startup CEO, mm. and I've got to raise venture capital to get this business going. Do I write a business plan? Do what do I do? The answer is yes. Okay. You write a business plan, but, the, but why write the business plan? This is what's different about getting to plan B and convention. You write the business plan because it is the lingua franca of the process. It allows you to, un, to uh, speak to the shareholders, the stakeholders, the partners, and explain to them what problem you're trying to solve, what solution you think you have, and what the business challenges are to that solution based upon a set of assumptions that you highlight in the plan as assumptions. Okay. Now, that plan A is the starting point of the journey. The journey, then, is a dashboarding process of addressing the leap of faith questions, those questions that are going to uh, are life or death for your business, mm -hmm. and using real metrics, empirical data, from real customers and from the marketplace to guide you to your ultimate better business model. Okay, so, so again, go, go, going back to the first time startup, uh, and, and you've perhaps not had the opportunity to go through something like this previously. Are there other models you can take a look at, yeah. you can borrow from to help you with this process? I like, to, I like the term borrow, I actually use the term steal. Okay. Um, which, is, which is all fair game in this business. Yes, absolutely. The dashboarding process we talk about here starts with the identification of the problem. Now, I'm sure in your experience like mine, oftentimes an entrepreneur will come to you with a solution without ever actually explaining what problem they were solving. The solution almost tells you what the technology can do, but not what people need it to do. So we take a step back and we say, identify the problem. Be very clear on the problem you're trying to solve. And the bigger the problem, the more people affected, the better the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Next, come up with your solution your unique way of solving that. Well, how are you going to delight the customer or solve their headache? That's your solution. Mm -hmm. But your solution is an hypothesis at this point, only an hypothesis. And so now you need a process of beginning to test that hypothesis. Now, the first thing you do is you test it against what you can borrow or steal, the experience of others. You need to look at the proxies out there. Almost everything that anybody plans to do today, somebody did something like it before some aspect of it, some key aspect of it has been attempted. Some companies have done that with success, some have failed. Both are very important data points. Okay. We call the former the analogs and the latter the antilogs. Mm -hmm. And they give you your secondary data that helps you to um, eliminate 
core questions so you can focus on the leaps of faith. Those questions that emerge after you've done all that, that are unique to what you're doing, that are life or death for your business. Okay, so can you give some, some, some examples mm -hmm. of that? Because I know you use e examples a lot in the book. Can you give a couple of examples? Sure. Um, I, I, one we like to use because it's easy to understand is the iPod. Okay. In, when the iPod was being developed, there were a lot of companies that had come before. There were companies that had um, uh, put together digital music devices, mm. small mm. digital music devices, poor interfaces. Mm. There were companies like Napster who had, um, who had pirated and, and promoted uh, digital music. There were companies like the Walkman. Sony and the Walkman, who had come out much earlier with a successful, very successful yes, product. Yes, indeed. So if you, were, if you were sitting in Steve Jobs' shoes, how would you evaluate this? The first, thing, first question you might have is, will people actually listen to music on headphones in a social environment? Now, you'd say, that's kind of a silly question to ask in 2002. But it's important to understand why it's a silly question to ask in 2002. It's because it was answered in the 1980s. It was answered by Sony. When the Walkman came out, yeah. one of the first things they had to answer, and you can imagine it was a mm. critical question, was, okay, we can make this device, we can put it on headphones, we can give it to everybody so they can take their personal music with them, but will they do that in a public setting? Steve Jobs didn't have to answer that question. He could rely on the, on the analog from Sony. Okay. Now let's look at the other side of the question. Nobody had been able to sell digital music at that point. It was being pirated. Napster was an antelog. There was no money in digital music. I have an analog solving one of my problems, an antelog solving the other. I now have a leap of faith question. Can I make a device that is better than, of course, the digital device that existed before, mm -hmm. and at the same time will encourage people to buy, not steal, music? The reason that becomes a critical leap of faith is if they're stealing it, Steve's going to be closed down the same way Napster was. Okay. So, uh, quite a number of, of the first-time entrepreneurs that I meet have, have new ideas to address new markets. And their feeling is there's, there's, nobody else has done this previously. Yeah. What, what, what's the, 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 the analog and antilog to that? I hate to burst their bubble. Okay. Um, Everything's been done previously. Okay. It may be different today in context, but even asking the question why it's different is critical. It's critical to understanding why those proxies are useful or not useful. Most people who say it's different are facing a whole bunch of antilogs they can't, they can't answer. And so their answer is, oh, they don't apply. They're different. Mm -hmm. that, that shortcut is bound to end in disaster. At the very least, you need to understand why those antilogs are different. And you have to understand very clearly. Because in doing that, you will come up with your leap of faith questions. Okay. So, if I, sorry, this, this is about finding a small number, hopefully, of very key <laughs> big questions mm. that you try and answer early on, quickly, cheaply, to get yourself through to where you want to go. Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. Does it also apply to things like the business model? Yes. It does because uh, as John started with the book before he even started, I started collaborating with him, the elements of the business model. Think about the classic business plan. Revenue line, gross margin line, expense line, working capital. Mm -hmm. Sum it up with what's the investment? Right. Those elements of the business plan all end up tying into this leap of faith process because, not, not because they, they become a um, plug in the field on the Excel spreadsheet process, because you have to present something. They become relevant because at some point, each one of those questions becomes a leap of faith question. An example, day one, my technology doesn't work I don't know if the customer will buy it, and I'm not sure I can get into distribution. Why am I focusing on my revenue line? It's, it's a red herring. Once I answer those three questions, get into the market, have customers buying it, now revenue becomes an important leap of faith. Why? Is this the right market? Is it big? Is it robust? Will they pay me enough? Can I price it properly? When it becomes a leap of faith question, it 
moves from the dashboard into your business plan and business model. And each one of those line items will eventually become highly relevant leap of faith that you need to address, but, excuse me, with real empirical data. Okay. So, so again, it's, it's the empirical data. Take your assumptions and test them. Yes. Take your big questions, test them, get answers to them. Um, so if, if, if that's working on the business side and the customer side, what about the investment side? Because most people in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, uh, most of the people that, that come to s and that you meet, are looking for venture capital to take their businesses to you know, power them out onto the r r r rocket ship to be the next Google or whatever it might be. How does it apply there? Because you, if you go to most VCs' websites, they will have a pretty standard, here's the pitch we want to see, mm -hmm that doesn't cover this. Yes, and, and sadly, that is the case. I think one of the goals with writing this book was to hopefully open up the dialogue between entrepreneurs and their constituencies mm -hmm. so that we could be honest with each other. We don't have to tell the white lies to each other. And these are the white lies that sort of lead us in the wrong direction. The entrepreneur yeah. knows that the plan isn't worth the paper it's written on. The venture capitalist also knows that it's unlikely that that's the plan that leads to success. And yet the entire dialogue becomes about the plan, not about the assumptions underlying the plan and how I will quickly and cheaply, as you point out, efficiently mm. and, mm. With a, with a, and economically resolve those questions. My hope is that this book will arm the entrepreneur and educate the investor to understand the process well enough to ask the right questions and focus on the right issues. So, uh, if, if, if um, some advice for, for a, a first-time entrepreneur pre pre preparing this pitch, um, do they throw out hmm. the, you know, the, the example that they've got from whoever's website it might be? Hmm. Uh, do they modify it? How do they approach this? I think it's certainly behooves them to be able to speak in the language of the audience that they're addressing. And if, mm -hmm. if that venture capitalist has a particular format they'd like to see, show it to them that way. But go one step further. Show them where you've made assumptions. Show them how those assumptions will impact the decisions you'll make down the road. And then show them a dashboard that lays out how you're going to resolve those quickly and cheaply so that you don't all end up in this long goose chase, wasting time and money against a set of problems that are wrong, a technology that doesn't mm. work, or a marketplace that doesn't exist. Can you explain a little bit more about the dashboard? Because I'm, I'm, people might get the wrong impression of this. What do you mean by a dashboard? What does that consist well, of? Well, so we've gone through this process of identifying the problem and mm. then coming up with your hypothesis solution, looking at analog and antilogs to resolve all the questions you can resolve from secondary data and then lining up your leap of faith questions, that okay. small number of questions you can focus on. Those leap of faith questions, by the way, are re a rolling set of questions. You start with the ones that are going to kill you today, you answer them or decide that they're no longer relevant, and come up with the next set that's going to kill you tomorrow. And so this process is a never-ending process. Those questions form the spine of your dashboard. Starting with those questions, you then determine what's your hypothesis on the answer to those questions? What's your hypothesis on how customers will respond to this product or how it will be priced or whether this technology will work at a particular scale or in a particular size or in a particular format? Then determine quickly what, what metric are you going to be able to use to get a sense on the 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. you're never going to play it all the way out, whether you're moving in the right direction. And then the last column in that dashboard is What's my course correction? That I may be right on my hypothesis. My metrics may bear it out. That question may be put to bed, and I may come up with another one. That's fine. But more importantly, I may be wrong. Wrong doesn't take you out of the game. Wrong is not failure if you use it as data and respond quickly. That last column is what do I do when I find out my hypothesis was wrong? It may open up a bigger door for you. It may shut a door and take you in a completely different direction. But hopefully, the quicker you get that answer, the sooner you get to the right, the right answer. Okay. Um, and and your, your message in the book is that um, by starting this dialogue with a VC, mm. to, to get them to, to look at that, you're more likely to 
one, be successful with, with, with the business because you'll answer those big questions. And secondly, by engaging the VC in a dialogue, you stand a better chance of, 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 of raising venture capital. Is, 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 is that the case? And well, I don't know about the latter. And, okay. that's, and that's because uh, culturally, you know, we're talking about a change. Okay. But I do think it's good due diligence for the entrepreneur because if they can't reveal their white lies, if they can't reveal their assumptions, <laughs> right. what kind of relationship are they going to have with this investor? Okay. I mean, we know that, that investors in Silicon Valley tend to be more activist than pacifist. And so you want to be in this endeavor with the right parties. If, if you're not going to be able to talk the truth to each other, if you're not going to be able to be in the same journey with each other, mm -hmm. if you're going to have to come into a board meeting sort of tell them everything is rosy, go back and figure out what you're going to do with your new data that tells you that the market doesn't exist, that's not a very good partnership. At the very least, by having this discussion, the entrepreneur should be able to filter out the parties that are going to be good partners from the parties who aren't. Okay. Now, um, from, from personal experience, I, I know there's, there's, there's always the question that comes from boards that says, all right, what happens if plan A doesn't work? Yeah. Have you got plan B yeah, figured yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and my answer to that is very often, no, I yeah. haven't got a clue what plan B is. Should you have plan B no. figured out? A plan B that is an alternative to plan A is as flawed as plan A. The plan B we refer to in this book is not a hedge plan. It is the evolving plan. It is the plan that you get to through good process. Mm -hmm. It's almost metaphorical because it really never ends. Even a business that's successful should constantly be going through leap of faith analysis to determine when it's not going to be successful or how it might be more successful. So it's a never-ending process. Plan B here is a metaphorical plan, which is the better plan. Okay. Can you give me an example, and if it's possible to talk about any of the portfolio co co companies that you work with, that have used this process yeah. to, to, to help them better than they have in the past? Well, two companies that I have personal experience with that are in the book. Mm -hmm. One is a company called Aggregate Knowledge. Okay. And Aggregate Knowledge started off as being in the recommendation business. They were building a very, very powerful um, database and behavioral targeting system for being able to uh, deploy recommendations across the web, not just in siloed insights. Terrific team. And we went out and quickly got a lot, number of customers, had booked millions of dollars in revenue in very short order, mm -hmm. only to find that our dashboard wasn't showing up correctly. We were starting to get metrics that didn't match where we thought they should be in terms of pipeline, in terms of the actual engagement, in terms of renewals. And we found that we had a false positive. They ran a dashboard process, and mm -hmm. the reason they found out in time, while they still had money in the bank, was because they were measuring constantly to determine whether they were on course. They then course corrected into a plan B, which had to do with um, a sort of taking that base and expanding it to the, um, the, the publisher side of the market, the publisher side, where they would be able to use this to better um, enhance the value of inventory on mm -hmm. publisher sites. Well, they had a very clear set of metrics for that. They went out. They got some early adoption, but by no means the level of engagement that they were expecting. And so over a number of months, they came back saying, this isn't working. They came back with a plan C. And the plan C, which seems to be working very well right now, is they found that actually on the demand side, the guys buying the media, that they wanted to have control over the enhancement of this inventory. Mm -hmm. And so today, they're now doing business with the agencies and the buyers of media only could have gotten there through constant, rigorous discipline and measurement that allowed them to course correct before they hit the wall and ran out of money. Now, this, this, is, this is really driving it down, down the way that you wanted it to, to, to go. Are there examples of companies in the past who've got to plan B by accident? Mm. Um, can you give some examples of that? Yeah, I think... We, as we said, we have many examples in the book. My, my, um, my expectation is that few of them had a plan B process in place. Mm. But they got to plan B through their own cleverness. Um, we look at PayPal in here, and we look at Max Lefkin's first idea, which was to build a little sort of security product that was going to reside on, um, on Palm Pilots. Well, there was, turns out there was no market for that. But he had a very good security uh, um, algorithm that allowed him to do anti-fraud. Well, by Plan G, he was in the payments business, right. PayPal, yeah. but Plan G. Now, Max may never have had it. You may not even know what a dashboard is, 
but he intuitively understood how to get there. Okay. We're starting to, to run out of time a little bit here. Uh, um, it's, it's a lot more I could ask you about. It's just gone by far too quickly. Um, are there any uh, words of advice for first-time on, 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 on entrepreneurs who, who do watch this show to get inputs on this? Are there any words of advice you can, you can offer to these people? Well, entrepreneurs need to have a certain level of impassion and engagement around their idea. They have to have some vision about how the world's going to be better. They have to have a real problem to solve. And if you don't have a real problem to solve, you probably shouldn't start down this road. But once you can engage your passions around that problem and you think you've got a solution, there's ways to address this that don't involve the sort of hit or miss process of plan A. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that entrepreneurs will be empowered by getting to plan B to be able to more directly get to the best business that they can build. Okay, that, that's great input. Thank you very much for that, Randy. I really do appreciate you taking the time to come along here tonight. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up now because we run out of time. So uh, thank you very much again for coming along. It's been great to see you here. And uh, this is thank you and good night from the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur. And look forward to seeing you again next month. So.